And you. now we're gonna we're gonna do the big old pivot, and uh, we're gonna go from 2020 venue challenges and, and welcome Joe and Alicia, um, and we're gonna be talking about structural media reform, um, which I'm so happy to have both of you all uh, on with us today, because I, I think. You know, when we talk about the structures of the music community, we talk about the importance and the requirement of our community to not be passive and to be active and engaged and think about what do we have control over and what are the, the, the sort of things that we can do, again, not just in a moment of crisis and not about relief, but about envisioning and reimagining what music can look like, and what these structures look like. It's about media and it's always been about media. And you know, not to be the old man in the Friday afternoon Zoom, but, you know, many of the uh, many folks in our audience did not live through the 1996 Telecommunications Act. They did not live in a world where commercial radio was locally based and was competitive and was robust and was really central to our culture. And, you know, those lessons, again, that we've all had to learn in the music community the hard way about what happens when you lose that sort of competition and, and diversity uh, and you get into these other structures that's a problem. So you guys are doing some interesting things. I'm going to start easy peasy and I'd love for you, for you to just introduce yourselves and talk a tiny bit about what you do at Free Press and what Free Press's mission is. And then we're going to shift into what we're really here to talk about today. Alicia, do you want to start and say hi? Sure. Um, thanks so much, Michael, for having us on here. Um, this is a really exciting and great space to be talking about this work. Um, my name is Alicia Bell. I, I work at Free Press, which is a, a national um, media and technology advocacy organization. And so um, we've been working for the, over the past 15, 16 years on um, various media and tech policy issues, as well as doing um, field and community organizing to support um, how we create it, local media infrastructures and ecosystems that really, really meet the needs of, of folks in a variety of local communities. Um, so I'm excited to be here as a part of the Media 2070 team, um, which is our, our project thinking about what are the, the media ecosystems that we need at a national and regional and local level in 2070, and then how do we start practicing those things now um, so that we're steeped in that culture by the time 2070 gets here. Awesome. We're so happy you're here. And, and Joe, would you talk a little bit about kind of your portfolio at Free Press and what brings you to this work today? Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, my name is Joseph Torres. I've been working at Free Press since 2007. Um, yeah, so, it's a advocacy group. I've worked on a, a whole bunch of issues through the years. Uh, the first issue I started to work on when I joined Free Press was low power FM radio. You know, uh, that was the first one, and it was an actual successful campaign. Worked with Hannah Sassman for the Prometheus Radio Project, and you know, and, uh, and so that was a, um, so, so it was only a clearly an you know, ownership issue, right? And um, local ownership and then work on media ownership issues and net neutrality, uh, working to build coalitions of racial justice groups to, uh, to have support in DC for the, not only to build support uh, nationally, it's bring greater, greater awareness to issues like net neutrality, um, but also to, um, uh, to make sure folks in DC know that uh, people of color uh, across the country care about these issues and care about policy issues. And, and now I'm part of the Media 2070 team where we're trying to, uh, uh, you know, it, we're trying, we're try, we want to we release an essay, we have a coalition where uh, we want to build a coalition to talk about what does media reparations look like for the Black community uh, to address the long history of harm uh, that the media system and media companies have done from colonial times uh, to the present day. So that's where, and, and, and uh, and I'll talk more about it, but I stopped right there. I stopped there. No, that's that's great. And 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 so, you know, part of the complexity of of, of twenty twenty, I think, certainly in in our community, in the music side, has been, um, you know, the pause has created space for reflection and for some real deep thinking and some real internal thinking. And and one of the things that's been fascinating to watch. Uh, in, 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 you know, so we have this, uh, this REDS initiative, which is the Reopen Every Venue Safely initiative with 11 pilot cities, where basically on an organic level, our, our pilot cities are, are convening on a weekly basis or bi-weekly basis, music stakeholders from across the city to, you know, explore issues about reopening and, and things like that. And, and, and most of our pilots, in a very organic way, that has 
led to, again, really fascinating conversations about how do we reimagine what our music ecosystems or music communities look like and what they should look like. And, and how do we articulate the flawed structures that have been barriers and, and, and challenges in many of our local music scenes? And then how do we flip that into, um, you know, into meaningful, actionable strategies and initiatives? And, and, and just one example on that uh, is, is we were really excited uh, over the summer to, you know, to, to bring Josh Kuhn in from, from USC um, and talk about one of Josh's initiatives, which is called Big Payback, which is basically digital reparations, you know, which is basically recognizing the power structures and in, in particularly in the major label side of, of the music industry and how they've been just deeply exploitative of, you know, essentially artists of color and, and, and made a lot of money off of exploiting back catalog in ways that the, those, 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 uh, you know, those, those license fees and, and other fees are just not getting to the artists. So, you know, that's an initiative that, that Josh is cooking up, you know, over out at, out at USC. But so I was just completely fascinated when I, I saw your release around media 2070 and media reparations. And I think these things completely align and completely connect. I'd love for you to just walk us through a little bit about, you know, both the big picture about what is the vision behind this and, 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 you know, why don't we just start there? What, what is the vision behind this and, and kind of where are you at this stage? Yeah. Um, so we we started this this project just thinking about um, one of the things that we had been doing in our, our kind of community organizing at a at a city level and a, a very hyper local level um, was talking to folks about media ecosystems and media infrastructures there. Um, and one of the things that we heard across the board being in, especially when we were in black communities and black and brown communities, is that there, there was an absence of trust, at least. Um, and in some cases, there was, there had been harm that had happened or harmful relational history. Um, and, and so out of that and interrogating that, what we really understood is that that was a symptom and it, it wasn't the core cause. Um, and so as we started kind of excavating and unearthing and exploring the core cause of that, that took us all the way back um, to the 1700s and 1800s and um, the release of newspapers and news organizations and media organizations and the ways that they, um, they, they really created foundations for exploiting and, and facilitating exploitation amongst people. Um, during shadow slavery. And so from there, we started writing. Um, and, and at first, I think someone proposed that we write like a 750 word op-ed about this. <laughs> um, and so uh, I think about that a lot these days because we just released the 27,000 word <laughs> essay. Um, and uh, what, we, what we figured out is that it was a little bit longer than 750 words to figure out how to bring us from se the 1700s to 2020. Um, and, and all the different examples of, of divisiveness, of anti-Blackness, of um, media infrastructure being used to shift public opinion and, and harm communities and, and kind of co-conspire with um, harmful poli media policies that were happening. Um, and so our, our vision is that this essay is just kind of the starting of, of really expanding the record. A lot of the history that we cover in the essay is not th are not things that people learn in schools and journalism schools and mass communications programs, any of those things. It's not common local history. Um, and so we really wanted it to be a space to create alignment around some of that unearthing. Um, and there were a lot of stories that we even learned kind of in the process that, that we, ha we didn't know about. Um, and, and so from there, we are, we are building a consortium of folks because this, when we think about kind of one of the bedstones of, of media, um, we, we, were thinking about, we were thinking about journalism and what is the role of journalism in this space. Um, but the more and more we wrote it, the more we were like, this is actually, this is, uh, this is the whole media issue. Um, it's not just journalism. It is, it is information media. It is news media. It is storytelling media. Um, and it, it really comes down to what is, how are Black folks able to hold and steward our stories and our, our communities' um, stories from ideation to distribution? 
That's really the question. Um, and that is a question that impacts all different kinds of sectors and industries within media. Um, so we're building out this consortium to try to bring people together and then figure out how we build a media reparations platform and then utilize that as a pathway to, to getting to whatever our dreamiest visions are for 2070 um, and our dreamiest visions for, for media, new media ecosystems. Because we know that what we have right now is not working. It is chaotic. It, it breaks easily um, and it's not sustainable. Well, and, you know, I think, you know, part of what, again, I, I think is, is um, you know, sort of the, just the evolution of the term reparations, you know, has been so fascinating to watch in the last, you know, seven or eight years. And, and part of what I, really inspires me about the essay and, and, and Alex put the, the links to the essay in, in, in the chat and I totally recommend it. It's, um, it is a long read, but <laughs> it's, it's well, well researched. Now there's a lot there. And I just really, you know, again, as someone who's been fortunate to do kind of media policy and activism for a couple of decades, it, it just is really enlightening and helpful, you know, to be able to take this arc and to see the through line and to say that this is not new, right? I mean, this is just kind of like how we've, I mean, not, you know, elements of this have been sort of baked into the pie from the beginning. And, you know, part of what I really admire about free press and, and, and partner organizations is then the ability to say, okay, we can be talking at a sort of an ideological or conceptual level, but now we can think about what does that actually mean in practice. And, and I know that, you know, by building the consortia, you're not being prescriptive right now and saying, okay, we've figured out the agenda. We know exactly what, you know, what it is. So I, I don't want you to kind of prejudge the process, but I do think that you can sort of intellectually think about how do you draw linkages to what reparations could look like in terms of policy, you know, and, and maybe Joe, you could speak a little bit about like some of the things that, you know, are either, I mean, this year's a mess for a lot of reasons. So I don't know if we need to talk about 2020 communications policy, but certainly things over the year or time or the time we've collaborated, you know, on some of these issues, what are some of those big ticket issues that tie in directly to these questions that Alicia was, was, was talking about in terms of, you know, access and control? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, as, as you, you know, a couple of things, it's like, um, you know, people of color have been fighting, black folks, in, 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 you know, have been fighting for, uh, a dem to democratize the media system for as long as the media system existed, you know? And the idea of, like, we talk about, just real quick, um, we start from colonial times where we find the first newspapers were also the print, you know, and the, the printers, the, the newspapers and their printers were, um, you know, uh, were involved in the slave trade, human trafficking, you know, they were, uh, 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 folks who sold uh, slave ads for, to, for the sale of slaves, often the publisher, who is also the printer, acted as the broker between the buyer and the seller. And so there's evidence that Benjamin Franklin was one of those folks, right? So the idea that you talk about in colonial times and how this was the sale of slave ads was critical to making the paper financially viable at this time, right? And we're talking about like we're talking about now uh, with uh, with uh, Governor Whitner, with uh, with uh, with uh, militia. You know, there was there was a coup in this country in 1898 in Wilmington, North Carolina, and one of the the the, the, um, the campaign leaders was Joseph S. Daniels, the editor of the uh, and publisher of the Raleigh News and Observer, right? And now we have like Fox News and we have Facebook, you know, and we have a president calling for white militia who was a media creation, you know, he's in, you know so like history continues to evolve and yet we have media policies that continue to give uh, broadcast stations uh, throughout its history to known racists and segregationists that we outline in, in, in the book or we have media companies who think like Donald Trump may be bad for America but great for CBS, right? <laughs> and they get all those stations, right? And so it's like we have a de facto media apartheid system, you know? And where uh, today as of 2017, uh, black people only own 12 percent, uh, only own 12 full power television stations in this country, less than 1 percent. And yet we, 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 we live in a, uh, uh, where we, we live in a country where uh, a multiracial democracy has not been fully realized. So if we're going to um, if we're going to truly live in and this is what the game is about right now, you know, <laughs> and so it's like so if we, if media has played a central role 
in the narratives that they put out in order to maintain a white racial hierarchy. And so if we think about media policy, in some ways it's very simple, right? In some ways it's like, what is the outcome we should see? Well, we should see a, a we should democratize the media system where, as Alicia said, uh, black folks have the ability to control and distribute, create and control the, uh, the creation of their own narratives and, and distribution of their own narratives, to be able to control the distribution and the platforms that they're on, right? And so what does that mean? What, is, what does it mean to have a, 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 a democratized social media platform, right? What does it mean, what, what does it mean for broadcast stations that have consolidated, right? We, right now, uh, the cases that we've been fighting for years uh, against the FCC further deregulating the broadcast industry because they have failed to address issue of minority and female ownership, right? That we've been winning in court. The court keep telling the FCC, you cannot further deregulate uh, broadcast, local broadcast stations in the, in the broadcast market because you have failed to study what is the impact on women and people of color. And Free Press have actually argued in court and the court continues in Philadelphia, Third Circuit, say FCC, if you failed to do this, they don't want to do it. They've taken it to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court... Uh, a few, a few, uh, just a few days ago, really, a, few, a couple of weeks ago, decided to hear that case. That puts the future of, like, what is the FCC's ability, like, it, it, you know, is paving the way for, like, this, you know, total massive consolidation of our media industry is already consolidated. So how are we going to have, for me, the question for me, and I'll stop here, is, like, how are we going to have it? For me, I fight for media policy issues because, I, I, uh, because it's a racial justice issue, Right. And so how are we going to have a, a how can a, a, a multiracial, it's a multiracial democracy, can it be fully realized? And one way we need to make sure that happens is that we, we need a media narratives that do not dehumanize people, you know? And so this, so this is the goal. So this is the goal. So look, can we have equity in ownership of the infrastructure? And I'm not just talking about TV stations. I'm talking about broadband networks. I'm talking about cable, cable networks. Um, all the different platforms that exist, you know? And so can we have policy that also like uh, by the community greater control and uh, to be able to hold their broadcasters or their, their media, infra whoever the media company is in the infrastructure accountable? How can we have more community control of the infrastructure? So these are just like things you can think about, right? The, the law, like what would it look like if we won, right? If we win this, right? How do you get there is the hard part. <laughs> it's the policy part. So I'll stop there. No, no. I mean, that's awesome. And, you know, folks watching, if you have questions, comments, you know, please throw them in the chat or in, in the q and I mean, I, again, I think, you know, the challenge and, and, and again, why, one of the reasons I'm so excited to have you in today's conversation is, is I think what, what we're all collectively struggling with is like on the music side. So as I said before, we've been having these very hard and very deep conversations about, again, some of the racial justice issues, some of the equity issues, some of the economic issues, I mean, all that stuff. And then the notion that in many ways, I, I don't want to, you know, the music community and industry is extremely complicated. And, and so I'm not trying to paint with a broad brush, but in, in many cases, it's been a, you know, it's, it, it's been built on, um, you know, cultural appropriation, exploitation, and we all know that, right? And, and so, so you've got one thread of like, okay, well, how do we understand that? And how do we think about that? And how do we think about you know, the complexity of communities like New Orleans and, and, and others, you know, with these unbelievably rich traditions that where do they fit into the overall sort of economic schemes and, 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 and the economic life and, and the sustainability for artists. You've got all that stuff here. And then, you know, a lot of, again, of, 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 of the implications of what you're talking about, you know, again, gets into then like, okay, how do we not, feel like a music version of climate grief, right? How do we not just shut down because it's too overwhelming, right? How do we boil it into, you know, something that we can take action on? And I would suggest there are, are kind of three pieces that are sort of underlying, you know, Joe, what you were kind of walking people through, you know, certainly it feels like, and this may be totally performative, but it feels like there's a lot of efforts now for big banks to put more capital behind black owned businesses and innovation, right? I mean, there's a $30 billion announcement this week or blah, blah, blah. I don't even know what that was. Well, if we're thinking about, you know, BIPOC built and owned and conceived of and oriented, you know, sort of platforms for art and communication and culture, do they have any chance of actually reaching audiences and, and succeeding in the marketplace if we don't have net neutrality? Right. I mean, like, you know, so are they going to have to negotiate with AT&T and Verizon to get carriage or are they actually going to have the ability 
to sort of build out these structures and innovate. And, you know, 10 years from now, we'll be seeing this whole new generation of stuff. Um, on the commercial media side, to your point, you said it really well, like we've seen more and more consolidation. It's, it's just, it's, it's been run away for the last 30 years. Um, it is what it is, you know, at this point, you know, we can try to roll it back and we can try to address it. And there are a lot of things we can and should be doing. That doesn't mean we don't fight it, but it's that one's sort of, you know, challenging to navigate, especially from a standpoint of like commercial radio. Um, but do these become opportunities in music context to fundamentally reconceive what is the role of non-commercial radio, right? We've seen how non-commercial radio has taken, you know, up the mantle of being the culture bearers and of doing, you know, having their local connections and of, of, of really doing what radio historically did in music. They've organically stepped up. They're building their own power through networks and through, through not programming networks, but through collaborative networks and leadership networks and like trying to think about how do we, how do these stations learn from each other and mentor each other? You know, the next 10 years can and will be and should be a really interesting conversation about how do we reconceive public media and how do we understand market failure, you know, as it relates to, to the music community and how do we look at stations like KEXP uh, in Seattle, which we, you know, love and hold up as like, you know, one of the beacons, you know, for, for music and, and for culture and community and look at what they did this summer with, you know, taking aggressive measures to look internally and say, what can we do to be an anti-racist organization? We're not doing enough. You know, so there's a lot of interesting things there that, again, don't have to feel like we're solving everything, um, which, again, is kind of unsolvable and exhausting, but it can be like, okay, where are the places that we can plug in depending on what or our passion is and or our needs are? Um, Alicia, I'm sorry, I've been talking way too much today. I, you guys are lucky you missed the first segment. That got really dumb. But um, I'd love to hear some ideas about, like, your process moving forward, how people can intersect with that. Like, what what are you anticipating is going to be, um, you know, kind of the response to this. Yeah, you know, that piece of, of overwhelm um, and, and climate disaster is so real. Uh, yeah. And so what I, one of the things I'm actually really excited about with this work is that, that that's been kind of our, we, we hold that and acknowledge that. And so that's why um, we know that there are people who have been for years fighting for reparations on different fronts and in different battles. Um, and so we knew it, it was not necessarily our work to be, to take on that whole mantle and just transform it or shift it or, um, so, which is why we came down to media reparations. Cause that, that even feels a, a little bit for us, at least right now, a little bit more uh, malleable and, and tangible. Um, and then within that, we're breaking it down to think about what does, reparation and reparative culture look like at a cultural level, an organizational uh, business level, um, a philanthropic level, and a governmental level. Um, because we also know that not everybody fights or feels comfortable um, being in all of those spaces. There are people who are a lot more accustomed and a lot more skilled at shifting um, cultures and practices within organizations and institutions. Um, and we, and so those folks, there's no reason to say, okay, well now go do policy. Um, and, and for the, the folks who have been doing policy work and are steeped in that space, there's also no reason to say, we'll go and do some organizational change organizing. Um, so we really want to hold that people have skill sets and expertises and knowledges in each of those different spaces. Um, and so from there, I think right now, um, the, the way that we're holding this work is that we are we're asking folks to kind of engage with the material um, and, and, and pause, right? So like, it's a one read the essay, yes, share it, amplify it, all of those things, um, and then reflect. So actually, in the, within the next few weeks, we're going to be releasing a reflection guide um, to, to really sit in that space of reflection and discussion. Um, and we're going to be hosting events that have to do with reflection and have to do with what do we grieve and what do we leave behind. Um, Today, we're having a launch party. Um, so we just released the essay on Tuesday. And so this week, it's about engaging with the material, amplifying and celebrating. Um, so we have a, a black DJ from, uh, from North Carolina, from Durham, who's going to be curating sound. Um, we have a poet from Arizona, from Phoenix, who's going to be performing. Um, we have some folks who have been doing 
media policy work for a while. Um, who are going to be speaking? Brandy Collins, Dexter, and Manolia Charlatan, and um, who are going to be there with us? And so it's a it's a moment for us to celebrate. Um, and so from the celebration, then we're going to be asking folks after the kind of engaging with the, the the material and reflecting and discussing. That's when we're going to start the dreaming process. Um, we're not jumping immediately into creating a policy platform. Um, so we're going to be partnering with different organizations and individuals and communities to host dream salons and visioning sessions so that we can be really aligned in our, our naming of a collective vision. That way, anything we build underneath that is in alignment as well. Um, because we, if we don't have the vision and we're not on similar pages there, then the pathways we create are going to take us all which ways. Um, sure. So that's why we're using that process and to make it, like you said, piece by piece. That's how, you know, you eat a large pizza bite by bite. Um, <laughs> so that's, that's what we're doing as well. That's awesome. I, you know, I just want to jump, um, build on what Alicia's saying and what you were saying. So like the reason we call it 2070 is because we, 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 we there was a commission on race in Chicago in, in 1922. Then we had the current commission in the late sixties. And we have the racial uprisings happening now, including in newsrooms and art museums and stuff like that happening. And so the idea is, it takes it takes it takes time. But it, uh, you know, as Alicia saying, is we, is we have if we continue to build the community, have a vision of what uh, what what is what the world ought to be like, what it should be like, and dream what the world should be. We have a path of what we know where we're going toward. I think too often in policy, it's about the intermediate. It's always been about the intermediate. We have to fight this battle now without a larger vision of like, what does a transformative media system look like? So the other side has an idea of transformation. How do you want a transformation for, for, for evil, basically, for, for, you know, for terrible use? We, we you know, but we're always, because we're, we're smaller, and, you know, like the, the, the number of us who work in this field, uh, it's about the next battle and we're so busy f- focus on winning, uh, preventing bad things from happening off, often. And so this is, an, uh, is we have a collective vision, uh, uh, we know the path we need. We have a better sense of the path we need to take. And then it can inform the kind of, uh, on the policy side, the kind of fights we need to engage in, how we engage them. So that's part of like um, the, uh, what we're, we're trying to do right now. I think that's so smart. And um, just congratulations on, on doing the work and, you know, the ability to take that long view and to honor the long view and, you know, to, you know, Understand. I mean, so, certainly something that we see um, so much in, in our work in the music side is just the fact that nobody has all the answers. There's no five point plan. But if you create the spaces like we try to do here in, in, in our Friday program to just say people with different perspectives and come together, we can cobble some things and, and, and we can kind of move through organically to figure out what these better structures can look like and how do we actually make them happen. Um, so, again, a huge shout out to the um, to the essay and I, I think on the essay you've got contact information right so if people are interested in, in in being part of the process and tagging in and potentially hosting events or just being part of the what what you're doing as you're, you're kind of building this out this year um and we um look forward to having you back you know i i i don't know if we're how long we're going to do the show so we won't have you back next week but you know um we, we'd certainly look forward to kind of keeping up with what you're doing and, and, and helping plug into it anyway that's helpful and, and uh, you know, creating that amplification. So, Joe and Alicia, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Thanks for your great work. And um, to all of you, again, who have spent a bunch of your Friday with us, we appreciate it. Um, the next three weeks, we're going to be getting back on the road in terms of our virtual city check-in um, conversations. Next week, we're going to be uh, in Portland. Uh, following week the 23rd, we're going to be checking in with our friends in Denver, talking about the Denver and Colorado music community. And then the 30th, uh, we are going to be in New Orleans, and we have been promised Halloween costumes for October 30th. So look forward to that. Um, as always, thank you to Alex Stolven for doing a great job producing this. If you thought the show was fun and useful and interesting, find the YouTube link, send it to your friends uh, when the archive goes live early next week. And as always, again, um, questions, suggestions, compliments, concerns, um, anything, uh, hit us up at musicpolicyforum at gmail.org. Thanks again. Have a great rest of your Friday. We'll see you next week. Bye now.